नित्यम नरम चरोतम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जय उदीर शृण्वता स्वकत कृष्ण पुण्य श्रवन कीर्तन हृदय तोस्ती भद्रा विदू नोति सुहृत्सता नष्ट प्रायु अभद्रेश नित्यम भागवत सेवय भगवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवति नैष्ठी नमो ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय सो इज इज द ऑडियो क्लियर क्रिस्टीना जस्ट ओके इट इज थैंक यू सो बेसिकली द प्रीवियस सेशन वाज मिस बिकॉज there was nashinga chaturdashi celebration in rindavan and i'm very happy um that basically we were able to also cover a few things before that so we are going to kind of have a summary study today summary of the previous chapters this would allow us to conclude um we would, this would allow us to conclude chapter 5 and chapter 6 of the first canto of shrimad bhagavatam so in the previous sex discussion we noticed that it was primarily focused on the causes of despondency the causes of dissatisfaction which was expressed by shri vyasadev to his guru shri narad muni and we took those principles and we applied it to the fact that those who are practicing devotional service at times they feel quite despondent and we need for us to understand that despondency while coming in touch directly with krishna through his holy names through the different pillars of devotional service is directly the cause of being also firmly in touch with material nature so the more profoundly one is in touch with material nature the sadist satisfaction and melancholy and sadness would be more profound it is a fact so if you're going to come in touch with krishna and at the same time you're also fully in touch with material nature through desires through activities and through aspirations most importantly because aspirations and goals drive desires they drive everything else so the little little aspirations little aspirations are driven by the larger aspirations for life so if the goal of life is not pure devotional service then there are many other aspirations which develop and those aspirations basically keep us fully in touch with material nature so the despondency and dissatisfaction of shila vyasadev was because he had given us and compiled the vedas for the souls to understand the vedas for them to be able to come in touch with vedic knowledge and what is the primary topic primary purpose of the vedas he basically compiled the vedas so that souls who want to come in touch with the vedas could access the vedas and engage in fruitive activity and resolve their desires so we we basically touched upon this principle in the previous discussion one has to engage in dharma when one is engaging in dharma they accumulate pious results this is reality this is in reality this is basically artha artha is pious results when one accumulates pious results due to engage in, engagement in dharma as defined by the vedas then they have the currency for them to be able to spend on kama which is desires they want to fulfill so we spoke up of the fact that if we have desires that remain unfulfilled it is because we lack the currency to fulfill them this is a fact so if we have desires material desires which are very frustrating because they don't seem to be fulfilling themselves we have tried our best it is because we lack the subtle currency the real artha artha is wealth but the subtle wealth which precedes the manifestation of opulences in this world is necessary for one to be able to make one to have the capacity to make things happen the capacity to make things happen in this particular world requires the accumulation of pious results 
pious results come to one who is engaging in the activity of dharma as defined by the vedas so this whole scope of vedic knowledge as compiled by shri veda vyasa was to facilitate the fulfillment of kama one engages in fruitive activities they have a fruit in mind they have a certain objective in mind they have an objective which is distinctly material in mind it is the improvement of material standards it is the improvement of material station it is the improvement of certain facilities they have a focus on material nature and they can even according to the vedas worship lord vishnu which is exactly what is also prescribed in many aspects of the veda is that you basically worship lord vishnu but lord attaining lord vishnu and serving him is not the objective in karma kanda the karma the fruit that is needed to be attained is the objective the focus is not on the lord the focus is on the objective of attaining a certain fruit the lord is going to give us so there are karmis there are karmis who are materially situated who worship krishna but their objective is to attain something and that objective has far greater prominence and importance in their lives than krishna himself this is the issue with karma where karma or objectives other than wanting to serve krishna can take precedence in such a way that they can completely completely shadow overshadow the presence of the lord in our lives we begin worshiping with a certain objective the objective now is bigger than the lord the objective is far more profound than the lord the lord is a means to that end the activity of engagement in certain sacrifices has an objective the objective is to improve certain material stations in life the lord becomes an instrument so he is invoked he comes he grants those desires and then he disappears from the lives of those devotees they are no doubt magnanimous they are following vedic principle they are following scripture they are trying to act according to scripture they are following all the principles of scripture for them to be able to attain a certain result however the defect in such a process is the objective is not to attain the lord it is not krishna who is the objective there krishna is a means to an end <coughs> sorry krishna is a means to an end krishna becomes an instrument to attain something distinctly material so that particular objective becomes bigger than krishna this is the issue with karma kanda this is the biggest issue with karma kanda is the karma itself is bigger than the lord because the lord is an instrument to attain such fruits so the worship of the lord the sacrifices to the lord the chanting of mantras arrangement for charity at specific times specific um, you know atonements which are being done all of these have an objective to attain that objective is distinct from the lord it is not the lord that is the reason why karma kanda is completely dismissed by our acharyas jnana karma adi anavrutam shila rupa goswami says jnana karma adi anavrutam anya vilashita shunyam jnana karma adi anavrutam anukulye na krishna anushilinam bhakti ruttama why is our acharya why is the our guru varga why is our acharya varga why is our disciplic succession rejecting activities that are associated with the vedas they are rejecting the activities that are associated with the vedas because the vedas themselves have fruitive objectives the lord is an instrument he is a mere instrument once the objective is attained then it is over it's finished and you will notice these instances while we study shrimad bhagavatam you will notice in many many cases where the lord's presence is invoked with certain objectives and once the objective is over the lord grants that objective he disappears from the view of the devotee it's over it's over the connection is over now shila vyasa dev compiled the vedas so that one could engage in activities of the vedas accumulate pious results and using those pious results they could attain objectives in life meaning if you have desires in the heart and if those desires are not getting fulfilled it's because there's a lack of piety there's a lack of accumulation of pious results there is no subtle wealth which has been accumulated if desires are not being fulfilled if desires are being frustrated it means that 
in some cases, why is it that desires come and they get fulfilled immediately is because they have currency for them to be able to spend. They have subtle currency which has been accumulated, which have the ability to expend for them to attain that objective. So it immediately gets fulfilled. So the point we are trying to make is the subject matter of the Vedas distinctly is fruitive activity. It is fruitive activity. It is basically where the Lord gets used as an instrument. He is the object of the sacrifices. He is the receiver of the sacrifices, but he is an instrument. The objective is bigger than the Lord, so it is dismissed. So this can't satisfy anyone. It is distinctly within the scope of material energy, and material energy can make one despondent. Dukkalayam, asashvatam, material energy can make one despondent. Why can't it make one despondent? Because material energy is... In, in material energy, you have a mixture, you have passion, you have ignorance. If there is any happiness, it's only in the mode of goodness. Passion causes anxieties, ignorance causes depression, literally. Ignorance is a focus on the past. It cannot see the future. It cannot even perceive the present. Passion is constantly focused on the outcome of activities in the future. Passion causes anxieties, yeah? And the mode of ignorance causes depression. And when anxiety and depression, passion and ignorance are in touch with and mixed with goodness, sometimes we experience happiness and sometimes we experience anxiety and depression. We feel despondent, we feel melancholy, we feel sad because we are in touch with the mode of ignorance. We feel greatly anxious because we are in touch with the mode of passion. We feel like acting all the time. With no end, sometimes, it agitates us. So, in material energy, if at all there is happiness, it is only in the mode of goodness. But that happiness is temporary because it is ruined by the intervention of passion and ignorance. Pure goodness is the nature of spiritual sky. It is the nature of the spiritual aspect of life where you go beyond material nature. Pure goodness is uncontaminated by passion and ignorance, which is why we say Nashta Prayeshu Abhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Seviya. Nashta Prayeshu Abhadreshu. This Abhadreshu, Nashta Prayeshu Abhadreshu. The getting rid of passion and ignorance is the objective. It is being stated right clear in the top, in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam. As we get rid of the passion and ignorance aspect, we are able to move forward. Now, the point we want to make here is when you do things which are distinctly within the scope of material nature, it is also within the scope of ignorance. It is also in the scope of, within the scope of passion. When it is in touch with ignorance, it's going to get destroyed. So it's temporary. When something is temporary, it can't be a cause of great happiness. If there is a certain object in life, if there's a certain kind of knowledge which has lasted very, very long, it is transcendental. That is the reason why it has lasted very, very long. Why is it that the Vedas, Vedic knowledge, even though they were spoken, they are Purusheya, they have been always existing. But why is it that they are still remembered and why is it that they have been able to carry forward the most important aspects to present day? The most important aspects of Vedic knowledge which have come forward to the present day are certain mantras. And those mantras themselves are very sattvic. The reason why certain aspects of Vedic knowledge have come to the present is because the mantras which are spoken there and the deities who are being worshipped are extraordinarily sattvic. They are beyond material nature. That's the reason why it has survived. If you have knowledge that is steeped in ignorance, it will disappear because there is no truth to it. So the point being that when you have so many defects within the material sky, the objectives are within the material sky, it is surely going to lead to dissatisfaction and despondency. Srila Vyasadeva compiled the Vedas and he did so with the objective of providing a means for people to attain their end. Oh, you're dissatisfied because you don't have a better station in life? Do this puja, do this fire sacrifice, invoke the presence of Krishna, and then you will have the ability to solve your problem, you'll be able to move forward. This is the subject matter of the Vedas. It's far more elaborate. I'm being simplistic. It's far more elaborate. So over a period of time, everything has to be proper. Rules have to be followed. The brahmanas have to be proficient in mantras. The ingredients, the dravya, which is used in the Veda, the, the sacrifices have to be quite of high quality. The time, place, and circumstances have to be carefully studied so it's done in a proper place at a proper time. 
And all of these, when they fall in place, then there's an objective. There's the, the ability to attain fruits. Otherwise, you get partial fruits. But since it is within material nature and passion and ignorance are in touch in that activity, there is sadness associated. So the cause of sadness, the cause of anxieties is material nature. The more they are in touch, the greater would be the anxiety, greater would be the melancholy. Srila Vyasadeva gave us this first part. It didn't satisfy him, quite obviously, because the activity that he described in the Vedas and the objectives themselves were not the Lord. It was tainted with objectives that are distinctly material. The next step which Srila Vyasadeva did after giving the Vedas was to provide the sutras. There are approximately 550 verses. These are the Vedanta sutras. And the Vedanta sutras themselves are a commentary on the Veda, but they are basically commentary on, and the, on the, the conclusion of the Vedas. And the commentary of the conclusion of the Vedas, which is the Vedanta Sutra, was compiled by Srila Vyasadeva. He gave us this. And basically, that focus of that particular Vedanta Sutra is moksha, which is to leave the material existence and go beyond material existence. So the first part, just the Vedas, focuses on attaining material desires. Surely, it can't be wonderful because it can cause a lot of pain, because there can be disappointments. The number two is the Vedanta Sutra, which Srila Vyasadeva provided. And that has to do with being able to satisfy those whose frustrations have come fully to bear. And they have decided that having objectives in the material world is fruitless. Let me try and leave this material world. That is the focus of the Vedanta Sutra. So people who are attracted to discussions of the Jnana Kanda, which is the Vedanta Sutra, the Jnanis who focus on and understand that objectives within the material sky are simply a waste of time. Let me go beyond. That is the Vedanta Sutra. Now, because the focus of the Vedanta Sutra is to go beyond the material sky, which is wonderful. It's a great improvement compared to the previous situation of fruitive activities, but it still does not give the happiness which is required and desired by the soul is because there is no rasa, there's no relationship. You go beyond and you surely can experience Brahma, Bhuta, Prasannatma. You go beyond the material sky, you can experience Brahma, Bhuta, Prasannatma. You can experience transcendental happiness in certain ways because you're aloof from passion and ignorance. Even if so, temporarily, you're aloof from passion and ignorance. So there is happiness there, but the satisfaction is not present because the soul is seeking relationships. And without a relationship, just being in a situation where you're not unhappy does not quite mean that you've cut it, you've made it. So the first part, the Vedas, distinctly problematic, fruitive activity. You're in touch with material nature. Leaving this fruitive activity, people are becoming frustrated, saying, I want out. I just want out. I want to go out of the material sky. That is the focus of Jnana Marga. And in Jnana Marga, the problem is there are no relationships. They go beyond the material world. But being a nature of a pleasure seeker who is full of knowledge, there's a lack of experiences because there is no relationship and the soul feels despondent. Srila Vyasadeva felt despondent with the first spot, providing Vedic knowledge in terms of compiling the Vedas for the karmis, the fruitive workers. He provided the Vedanta Sutra for the jnanis so that they could enmesh themselves with the process of jnana marga and then conclude that material existence is a complete waste of time. And there, are, there is worship in both, by the way. There is worship of Krishna in, in Karmakanda. There is worship of Krishna in fruitive activity. There is worship of Krishna in jnana marga. Believe it or not, in the first category, Krishna is an instrument. Krishna is worshipped so that a certain objective is attained. In the second category of jnana marga, Krishna is worshipped for purification. Krishna is again an instrument. It is not for the purpose of developing relationships. You will find Brahmavadis, you will find those who want to leave the world and purify themselves and be in an impersonal void. They worship the Lord as well. They worship the deity. But they commit offenses because they worship the deity purely for the sake of purification. 
their objective being purification from material nature, they objectively worship Krishna and they say, Krishna, I am worshiping you, you purify me, and once I'm purified, you're not required, you are false. You are a part of this material nature. This is the problem with the Ghanis, the Mayavadis. What is the problem? They are a little better than the fellows who worship for the purpose of fulfilling material desires. Why? Because their desires are beyond the material sky. Um, Haribo Prabhu Zamataji, someone's phone or um, tablet could be on mute. Um, could you put yourself on mute, please? Can you check and see if anybody is not on mute? Thank you. So the, the, the Ghanis have objectives beyond material nature. It's an improvement. They worship Krishna, but their objective of worshiping Krishna, worshiping Krishna is not to serve Krishna's senses, not to develop the rasa, to develop a mellow of relationship with him. Their objective is to purify themselves. They feel that once I'm purified of material nature, Krishna, by coming in touch with your senses, I've figured out that you can purify me. But once I am purified, I'm out of material nature. I have nothing to do with you. This is where Vedanta Sutra ends. It does not provide you with an objective of relationships. There is no relationship there. There's no objective of wanting to come in touch with Krishna to have a relationship. There's no mellow in the Vedanta, in the Vedanta Sutras. That's the reason why Srila Rupa Goswami says, Anya Bilashita Shunyam, Jnana Karmadi Anavratam, Jnana Karma Adi Anavratam. Yeah. Why is Karma and Jnana being rejected? For this purpose. Krishna can be worshipped, but the objective may not be to serve him. The objective may not be to be an, a part of his entourage. The objective is not to develop a relationship with him. Prema is not an objective. It is merely either to attain a material objective or it is to relieve oneself of material distress. Jnana Marga is basically a realization that anything and everything you do in this world is false. It's a waste of time. It is surely lofty. They worship Krishna, but the objective is to purify their senses. They simply want to purify their senses. They want to purify themselves. So Krishna is out of the way once this objective is attained, which is quite unfortunate. So that's the reason why when Srila Vyasadeva provided Vedic knowledge, the, the four Vedas, he compiled them. He was not satisfied. He compiled the Vedanta Sutra, which allows the jnani to leave the world. Moksha is attained. Because there's knowledge in the Vedanta Sutra which allows them, allows one to have knowledge that this particular existence is false. He was not satisfied. Srila Vyasadeva was not satisfied. He was despondent. He then compiled and he put together the Mahabharata, which allows people like us who are in Kali Yuga to understand the objectives of the sutras, the objectives of Krishna in a much more cogent, easy to understand manner, because in the form of a story, it is easier to understand the application of Vedic principles. He allowed us to do that, but he was not satisfied. The point being, all of this work that he had already done was either to help one attain material objectives or to leave the world so that material issues can be ended. And this was not satisfactory because in both cases, there is no objective of wanting to attain prema there is no objective of wanting to attain prema. There's no objective of wanting to come in touch with Krishna for relationships. We, we worship Krishna and we get purified as well. But we don't worship Krishna with the objective of purification. We don't chant for the objective of purification. Our objective of chanting the holy names and our objective of worship of Krishna our objective of discussing Srimad Bhagavatam is to develop a relationship with Krishna. Our whole objective is to attain prema. We should never ever move away from this objective because we should never ever have any other objective in mind because it could be confusing. Then we could fall into the dangerous root zone of purification. That is the Ghani's attainment. It is not our attainment. Purification for us is a matter of fact. Purification is a matter of fact, something that is going to be attained along the way. It's not the goal of Krishna consciousness. Purification is simply a matter of a spillover benefit, which is going to be attained along the way. One needs to be purified from the influence of material nature for them to be engaging in spiritual activities. Yes. 
but that's not the objective of Krishna consciousness. The objective of Krishna consciousness is the deity is the archa vigraha is non different from Krishna. We worship the deity, we have certain procedures. The Vaishnava Acharyas have certain Pancharatra. She Narad Muni has given us the Narada Pancharatra. Our worship standards are being derived from the Narada Pancharatra. You will notice almost that the, the Dhyanis, the Mayavadis, they worship the Lord, they worship Radha and Krishna. And they follow almost what we do, but their objective is faulty. Their objective is these murtis are going to be worshipped so that I can be purified. So that's the only difference. There's a huge difference there. There's no objective of relationship. Srila Vyasadev was despondent because there was a tainting of material objectives in the first situation, which is with the Vedic knowledge for performing sacrifices. It was a tainting of you know, the objective of wanting to attain liberation without relationships in the second cause, which is the Vedanta Sutra. And ultimately, his despondency was such that he was not satisfied with what he had done. Because he knew that since he's not satisfied, he can't be satisfied. And we can't be satisfied either as living entities. We cannot be satisfied with the objective of the Vedas. We cannot be satisfied with the objective of Vedanta Sutra. We can only be satisfied by coming in touch with Srimad Bhagavatam because the focus of Srimad Bhagavatam is completely aloof from the objectives of the Vedas or the objectives of the Vedanta Sutra. The objective of Srimad Bhagavatam is to establish a relationship between us and Krishna, the loving relationship between us and Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam is Krishna personified. Srimad Bhagavatam is Krishna personified. Because Srimad Bhagavatam is Krishna personified, when we interact with Srimad Bhagavatam, we interact with Nama, with the holy names of Krishna, the scope for us to come in touch with him directly and to develop the mellow of relationship is profound and it is just exactly the objective of our Acharyas. That is the reason why it is said that Srimad Bhagavatam has been authored specifically for those who have the objective of Krishna Prema. The objective of Krishna Prema given by Mahaprabhu is practically the same objective of Srimad Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam establishes a relationship. The Bhagavatam from beginning to end establishes a relationship. And that's the reason why the objective of Nama and Bhagavatam are the same. The despondency of Srila Vyasadev is being seen here. In the subsequent situation, Sri Narad Muni starts talking about the process. The process of attaining Prema is being described. He's basically describing Sadhana Bhakti. He is describing Sadhana Bhakti and this is extraordinarily, extraordinarily important because the description of Srila Narad Muni's own experiences is profound. In the first case, the instance of Narad Muni being the son of a maidservant and being five years old is being shared. What is significant about being the servant of a maidservant? I mean, sorry, the son of a maidservant. Being the son of a maidservant is significant because in such circumstances, one wouldn't have had the ability to gain any distinct knowledge because the mother being of such very, very modest means would not have had the ability to put her son through some lofty education even those days. So she wouldn't have had the sophistication to send the son for lofty, you know, for, for very uh, sophisticated, I would say, education. That's the first principle, that being the son of a maidservant also means that he did not have the birth where he did not come in a certain lineage, which was steeped in knowledge where just being in touch with the lineage, one also has some level of Sukriti. Because the forefathers are of a certain nature, they have trained the family in certain ways, the family members behave in certain ways, and that culture is being passed on to the child, and the child picks up immediately. That advantage was not present with Srinarad Muni. He did not have the advantage because he was a very, very... Uh, you know, he was, the, he was an, in very, very humble means, a person of very humble means. So he basically was a five-year-old. It is said that a five-year-old's intelligence is not fully developed. One can't really claim that a five-year-old's intelligence is fully developed. So he was not really blessed with extraordinary intelligence. One can say that a five-year-old's intelligence is not fully developed. 
So one can say that age was not a big advantage for Narad Muni. He was the son of a maidservant, no advantage due to birth. He was not well situated materially. He was also five years old, so one can't really claim that this was a person who had gone through life and had understood life. He was five years old, so no distinction, no advantage due to age. It's very, very important. Now, if you study that there was Sukriti, his mother was not a maidservant elsewhere. She was a maidservant in an ashram. This ashram catered to serving the needs of very exalted sages who used to stop during the rainy season. Chaturmasya, the four months starting July through Karthik, is generally the monsoon season in India. And then during those times, because everything those days was done by foot, people used to travel. And as a consequence, if there were rains and there was monsoon, there was flooding, there wasn't, travel was very restricted. So that was one explanation where you never traveled during Chaturmas. You stayed in one particular place and you engaged in austerities because travel is an austerity. If you are, if you're renounced, travel is an austerity. If you're not performing the austerity of travel, then you increase the austerity of foodstuff. So Chaturmas has certain foodstuffs to be avoided, certain kind of ratas. All of this is being done so that there is austerity being introduced because the sages and the transcendental personalities, then their movement used to be a bit restricted. So they used to put themselves through austerities. It is also significant that it is a time during the one year period when the Lord is resting. And as a consequence, it is not considered auspicious for any kind of activity other than spiritual progress. So there was almost a cessation of social activity in the land because during Chaturmas, there would be no functions that would be held because the Lord is considered to be resting in, the, in that particular time period of four months. So during Chaturmas, the transcendental sages were assembled in the ashram. And this maidservant's son, Sri Narad Muni, in his previous Janma, he had the opportunity to serve them. And he served them quite sincerely. Pranipatena, Pariprashnena, Sevaya. He served them quite sincerely. And being very young and simple-minded, because young children have a great ad advantage. In most cases, they have a great advantage because they're simple-minded. Their simplicity is such that their intelligence not being fully developed has the ability to absorb things as it is. And their faith is very, very, I would say, um, you know, based on, it's, it's, it's quite, it can be quite firm simply because of the fact that the intelligence is not developed, so it's not contaminated by coming in touch with material nature, and that intelligence has the ability to accept transcendental truth. So as a five-year-old, he was serving these sages. He was in the vicinity of the ashram. He used to do some menial service. This is extraordinarily important. Menial service to transcendental personalities is extraordinarily important. We have discussed this in the first and the second chapters of the first canto. When one engages in menial service, then this particular aspect of Bhakti Devi wanting to descend from the heart of those who are being served into the heart of those who are serving is natural. It is a natural flow of Bhakti Devi from the heart of the transcendentalist into the heart of that boy. That five-year-old boy was innocently serving them. What did he also do? He very distinctly mentions that I took the remnants after receiving their permission. He took permission from the sages and he partook, he accepted the remnants of prasadam, that is Mahaprasad. He accepts the remnants of prasadam and he honors the remnants of prasadam left behind by these transcendental sages after taking their permission. When one accepts the remnants of prasadam from someone who is elevated, then they are surrendering to that person. This is a form of surrender. When one is accepting the remnants of someone who has partaken prasadam, a sage, a transcendental personality, a Vaishnav who is quite distinct, when we accept the remnants from such a person, we honor the remnants, we are surrendering to them. This surrender is pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya. This is very clear. He had already surrendered. He was already serving them. 
there is also a second explanation. Sri Rupa Goswami talks about this. What does he say? He says, Seva unmukehi jihva adav. Seva unmukehi jihva adav. Seva has to start with the tongue. Seva has to start with the tongue. So Sri Narad Muni is again exemplifying in the beginning of the Bhagavatam that I partook remnants. When I partook remnants from these wonderful sages, the Sevon Mukehi Jagwado, that principle begins. It becomes easy to chant. Your Seva begins when you have when you honor Prasadam, the tongue is prepared for the dancing of Krishna as the holy name. It becomes easy to chant. Then you have also accepted remnants as a consequence, you're surrendering. The moment the principle of surrender comes into play, then faith is established in the heart. Faith is established in the heart. The faith inside the heart of the transcendentalist is passed on to the heart of Sri Narad Muni's when he was a little boy in the previous lifetime. The moment surrender occurs, faith from the guru's heart goes into the disciple's heart. Along with that faith comes Sambandha Gyan. Along with the faith comes knowledge which the guru has in his heart of Krishna Sambandha. The guru's Sambandha is revealed to the disciple when we accept beads in initiation. When we accept the beads in initiation, the guru's Sambandha is a part of the blessing which the guru gives when he is giving beads to us. Which is the reason why we get attracted to specific personalities in certain ways and we worship them, the guru. We also attract and become receptacles of their Sambandha. If the Guru is advanced and his Sambandha with Krishna is performed, then the pathway for us to attain that proficient knowledge is also there. The pathway has been opened up. The scope has been opened up because the Guru has already traversed that path. He has attained knowledge and now he has opened up that path so that we could attain knowledge if we walk on the footsteps, you know, following the footsteps of the Guru. So Sri Narad Muni received remnants. He accepted those remnants, honored those remnants, and he received faith through that process. He says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the moment I had those remnants, the nonsense in my heart just disappeared. This is called mercy. When he asked them for permission, it is said that one should ask for permission. When he asked them for permission, they gave permission, he accepts it. Then he is basically connected to those sages, and those sages are glancing at him mercifully. Bhakti Devi goes from the sage's heart into Sri Narad Muni's heart. This is the source of bhakti. Bhakti is the source of bhakti. So bhakti goes to Sri Narad Muni's heart and he says he immediately felt that there was a big change. He immediately felt that his heart was cleared up. This was a young boy. He was a very young boy. You know, how contaminated could he have been in his heart in the first place? This was millions of years ago in Satya Yuga perhaps. And how contaminated was the environment at the point? So the point is that there were many wonderful things that were present at the time. But even then, Sri Narad Muni says, my heart became clean. Even though he was situated in an ashram in an age which was not Kali, it was Satya. It was a very, very powerfully, I would say, Sattvic age. The atmosphere was surcharged with goodness during Satya Yuga, which is why when you reach Srimad Bhagavatam, you find the demigods arriving, leaving, coming, going. The demigods are manifest. People see demigods. The reason why this was happening was because the atmosphere was highly sattvic as a consequence. People of a higher nature could enter in and leave. They could very easily come and go because the atmosphere was sattvic. Today it is not, obviously. And that's the reason why seeing divine presence is very difficult. It is very difficult today because they don't come. They don't come unless you have the ability to reach there. They don't come very often because they're here. The consciousness is really down. The atmosphere is surcharged with passion and ignorance. Those days were surcharged with goodness. The devas used to come. So you read in the Srimad Bhagavatam that the moon god comes, Lord Indra comes. You have the different personalities come, give blessings. They appear quite easily. All of this is because the atmosphere itself was such that it was conducive to attract them. Now, what we also need to understand is that he receives this mercy and there's even more mercy after that. He calls it mercy. 
his mother, while engaging in the household duties, gets bitten by a snake. He calls it the serpent of time, a very young boy whose only refuge is his mother, and that mother gets taken away by the time factor. Now he is left with nothing but Nama. This is the essential quality of a sadhu. When a sadhu, when you say someone is a sadhu, it means they're dependent on Nam. It means they're completely dependent on Nam. And as a consequence, circumstances in life would be such that they have to depend on Nam, nothing else. It is said, Srila Prabhupada writes, yeah, the, mater the material fever would start diminishing spiritual activities would increase. The material fever would diminish. Spiritual activities would increase because now the person is dependent on Nama. Sri Narad Muni at the age of five became dependent on Nama. Nama alone, his mother had left. Now Nama has the responsibility to take care of him. Then he started making an attempt saying, okay, now I have been given this wonderful gift which gives me joy. I'm going to treasure this. I'm going to continue walking and finding a place for myself so that I could practice this. So he starts traversing. When you start chanting sincerely, the path of life begins opening up because our desires get modified. Our desires for the future get modified. We see a different future when we start chanting. And when we see a different future and we start desiring that future, certain pathways begin opening and it's quite mystical certain pathways start opening in life and we reach our objective in a quite an easy manner. It's almost as if a pathway, which is quite distinct and different from what it was before, has now opened up and now we are walking on the royal road of bhakti and we are attaining this objective. It's quite profound. When we start chanting Nama, pathways start opening in life and we start moving towards those. It is mystical. It's quite mystical. It's very mystical in terms of the arrangement. You suddenly find that you have a new set of friends, society has changed, social relationships have changed, food habits have changed, desires are changing, objectives are changing, nature of holidays are changing. Yeah? Very rarely do you find devotees going away to have fun. For the most part, they use their vacation days to come to down. You find the objective of vacation changing. Everything changes because you're in touch with Nama. So Sri Narad Muni was chanting Nama. It opened up a pathway in front of him. There was a particular intelligence that was given by the super soul who is within. Krishna is within the heart. He started guiding Sri Narad Muni. Go here, go there. He started traveling. And he also says he started traveling. He basically sat down. He found a place. He sat down under a tree. And then he goes on chanting because he is in touch now with transcendence. The statement of Shastra that the holy names are sweet is not a theoretical statement. The holy names are not theoretically sweet. The physical sweetness of the holy names is experienced by sincere chanters. The physical sweetness, like you put some kind of um, you know, a candy piece, a piece of candy in your mouth, you experience sweetness. The same candy sweetness is experienced physically by those who are sincerely chanting. So as a consequence, the desire to chant becomes more profound. The quality of pure goodness is sweet. The quality of pure goodness is sweet. When one's consciousness traverses higher and higher and you reach pure goodness or you start reaching pure goodness, you're on the way, you're pretty close, you start experiencing sweetness in the mouth while you chant Harinam. Now you should understand that that's a stage. It's distinctly an opportunity. The Acharyas were not making it up. They were not talking about sweetness to encourage us in falsehood. It was not being described in vain that, oh, the holy names are sweet. It was not described that by what Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, I was swimming in an ocean of nectar. Not a false description. It is not out of reach because that is factually true. 
because the nature of pure goodness is sweet. The nature of relationships in pure goodness is sweet. It's candy sweetness. So once your consciousness traverses and goes higher and higher as you approach the, whole, the, the transcendental nature, as you approach basically uh, pure goodness due to, the, due to the mercy of the name, then you start experiencing candy sweetness in the mouth. So he can't stop. He was being fed by the holy names. He can't stop. He was completely satisfied. He's calling upon the holy names because they are sweet. He's calling upon the holy names and his consciousness is now reaching the point of being submerged in transcendence. It is time for Krishna to show up. So Krishna first appears in his heart and then he appears in front of him. Sri Narad Muni can't really describe the ecstasy that he goes through. So in one sense, he does not even know what he's experiencing. He is blinded by the extraordinary, extraordinary, um, um, I would say, he's blinded by the extraordinary nature of um, the presence of the Lord. And then he begins communicating. He's wanting to see where the Lord is. The Lord disappears from view. Then he becomes despondent again, saying, my Lord has disappeared. You have disappeared from my view. Then Krishna says, I will not appear again. You have to come to me. Now he starts chanting sincerely and leaves his body. And the next birth is Narad Muni. He becomes a transcendental traveler. So what is also being said here? What is being said here is that Sri Narad Muni is eternal. But at one point in time, he was on the planet. If someone was on the planet and then they go back to the spiritual sky, this moment on, they're eternal, aren't they? They are eternal. So that's the confusion about people going back and not being eternal. They're eternal now. So the point is that he has now reached his eternal state. He is now broadcasting the message. He is now empowered in the subsequent birth to spread the mission of bhakti. Wherever and wherever bhakti needs to be surcharged, Sri Narad Muni is present. Wherever someone has to be encouraged, Sri Narad Muni is present. He is present to encourage that person. He's present there to give the blessing that's required for the devotee to move forward. The connections are being made. You'll notice that Dhruva Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj, all the great personalities, they were all touched by Narad Muni. They were all 100% touched by Narad Muni. You take up Dhruva Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj, practically every canto of Sri Narad Muni has practically been an instrument for giving bhakti. So he's describing to Srila Vyasadeva that this is my journey because Srila Vyasadeva becomes curious. And he's also telling Srila Vyasadeva, he's giving instructions. He's saying, you are an incarnation because you are an incarnation. We spoke last week. Being an incarnation, even though he was an incarnation, he became despondent. Anybody can become despondent if they come in touch with material nature, including incarnations. Shinarad Muni was hearing from Srila Vyasadeva and he was telling Srila Vyasadeva that you are an incarnation you have the ability to factually experience Leela. Because you have the ability to factually experience Leela, write down about the glorious activities of the Lord. And by writing down the glorious activities of the Lord, you will feel great satisfaction. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he basically did not want any natural, he did not want a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra to be written. The 550 verses, approximately, I think 550 verses of the Vedanta Sutra, which they have that particular 550 verses of the Vedanta Sutra, which talk about the conclusions of the Vedas and to talk about transcendence and talk about the goal of life, etc. That particular 550 verses have motivated, you know, I would say commentaries by every, every school. The school following Shankaracharya has a commentary on the Vedanta Sutras. The school of Sri Ramanujacharya has a commentary on the Vedanta Sutras. The school of Sri Madhvacharya has a commentary on the Vedanta Sutras. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, no, we don't want a commentary on the Vedanta Sutras. We are a bona fide par parampara. Our origin is Brahma Madhva. But we don't want to write commentaries on the Vedanta Sutra because we have a natural commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. The person who compiled the Vedanta Sutra, 
the person who compiled the Vedas is Vyasadeva, and now he has basically put together his realized nectarian experiences in Srimad Bhagavatam. Since this is the end point of contribution of Vyasadeva, what is there, why is there a need for another commentary on the Vedanta Sutras? This is a natural commentary because the person who, tra- who basically gave us everything in the Vedas is finally, after his despondency, making a final offering, and this is the essence. This is a natural commentary on the Vedanta Sutras. So Mahaprabhu did not want that. But because there was a little bit of political resistance in the 17th and the 18th centuries and the 19th centuries from other sampradayas saying that you guys are not bona fide because you don't have a commentary, Sri Baladev Vidyabhushan, under the direction of Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, undertook the writing of the commentary on the Vedanta Sutras for the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. This was undertaken and done by him in seven days. It was dictated by Sri Sri Radha Govinda in Jaipur. And that's why it is being called the Govinda Bhashya. It is said that Radha Govinda appeared and they dictated. They dictated the verses there. They dictated the conclusion of the Brahma Sutras to um, Baladev Vidya Bhushan Prabhu. That's a consequence. He called it Govinda Bhashya. It is the Bhashya or the commentary of Govinda himself. So our commentary is the Govinda Bhashya. But Mahaprabhu did not want anything to be written. He said, Srimad Bhagavatam, when it is available, it's a natural commentary on the conclusions of the Vedas, then we use that. In fact, everything which Mahaprabhu has given us, everything which our predecessor Acharyas have given us, have their roots in Srimad Bhagavatam. Everything. Basically, if we study Srimad Bhagavatam, you will notice that you will understand the works of our Acharyas because they have done everything based on the Bhagavad Gita. Srila Jiva Goswami wrote the six Sandarbhas. It's a commentary on the Bhagavad It is said that Sri Sanatana Goswami started the work, Srila Jiva Goswami finished it, but in reality it is to be ascribed to Srila Jiva Goswami. He finished it under the blessings of the other Acharyas in Vrindavan. So there is a Sat Sandarbha, which is a more close commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam. Then there's Lagu Bhagavata Amrita, there's other people who have written Bhagavatam commentaries in our lineage. All of these, practically all their work is centered in on Bhagavatam. So the point being that the mature fruit of Srila Vyasadeva's realizations, and Vyasadeva was an incarnation. Sri Narad Muni tells him, you are an incarnation. You are at the same level as the Lord. You have the ability to visualize his pastimes. Everything in Srimad Bhagavatam was seen by Vyasadeva in his heart. He visualized all the experiences. He had experiences of the different avatars. He saw the creation of the universe. He saw the dissolution of the universe. He saw the different avatars enacting their pastimes. He saw all of these and he recorded them. And as a consequence, this is the most natural commentary. And it is one of the most powerful commentaries. It's not different from Krishna. So as a consequence, what we are trying to say is that this was basically being shared by Sri Narad Muni. Sri Narad Muni says in the beginning, please start writing the Bhagavatam. You can see the pastimes. Nobody else can do this. You have a direct vision of the pastimes. Nobody else can do it. Start writing. Because you can give faith. When I can, for example, see something here. For example, I see out of my window, I'm actually quite fortunate this is my bedroom window. As I see out of the window, I see the Samadhi of Srila Prabhupada in Vrindavan. I can also see Sri Sri Radha Shamsundar's temple. You know, I see this out of my window. So the point is, when I'm seeing out of my window, I'm seeing these temples and I'm seeing the Samadhi. So this is Pratyaksha. My senses are observing the existence of these structures, these buildings in this place. When I'm giving you a description of this place, I'm directly seeing it. My description, if it is noted in a book, it becomes Shabda Praman. Pratyaksha is to perceive through the senses. My senses are able to see the Dham from my window. I start writing a book on these experiences, or I, I I start writing a book on what I see. Then that becomes Praman, that becomes solid proof because I have perceived it through my senses. And as a consequence, that can be taken literally as a truth because I have perceived it through my senses. 
So this is the difference between speculation versus real knowledge. Srimad Bhagavatam is real experiences of Srila Vyasadeva. When we accept the Srimad Bhagavatam into our hearts, then we have the ability to come in closer, closer in touch with his experiences as well. Because he has the faith, his faith, is, his faith comes from experiences. He has already seen the Bhagavatam. He has written it. When we accept it, then we receive that faith into our hearts and it grows. So this is the nature of discussion between Srila Vyasadeva and Sri Narad Muni, where they are exchanging their views on what should be done. And this is the beginning where Sri Narad Muni describes his journey. His journey is so inspiring because he is now talking about the, I would say, the magnanimity of Nama. He is also talking about the process of starting Nama. He is talking about receiving mercy from the sages, receiving bhakti from someone else's heart who has a lot of bhakti. How do you receive it? You serve the person favorably. When that person is served favorably, they give you bhakti because they have it in their heart. And then bhakti is cultivated through bhajana kriya. He takes his beads and keeps chanting. He experiences the different stages. He first says that nashta prayeshu, abhadreshu, all contamination is gone. Then he's talking about ecstasies coming in because he is talking about coming in touch with the pure sweet names of the Lord. Then the Lord himself appears with focused chanting, and then he departs to the spiritual sky in a spiritual body, and he remains in that particular state, eternally liberated, serving the Lord in different capacities. So this is quite profound in this particular chapter, where these particular stages of bhakti are being given here. The stages of bhakti are being given here. Adho Shraddha, Sadhu Sangha, so there's faith, there's an establishment of faith, how do you repose faith? He is accepting the remnants of the sages. That is the reposing of faith. Then Sadhu Sangha, he's receiving association, he's receiving bhakti. He's engaging in bhajana kriya, which is the chanting of the holy names. All that is contaminated in the heart goes away, without which you can't experience sweetness when you chant, because contamination in the heart from passion and ignorance once the passion and ignorance is completely eradicated, or as they closely get eradicated, one starts receiving the, you know, one starts coming in touch with the name in, in a much more profound way, and they experience sweetness. And then he becomes fixed. He then develops ecstatic emotions of bhava. So there is nishta after after anatta nivati, after the nonsense is removed, after passion and ignorance is removed, there's nishta, they're being fixed being fixed in your eternal state, being fixed in the mellow of relationship with Krishna, that gets revealed during Nishta. There will be early signs that this is my inclination. This is my relationship with Krishna. Until passion and ignorance don't leave in the heart, don't, don't leave the heart, it is difficult to know our relationship with Krishna. Once they start leaving and then most of it is gone, our chanting process will start revealing the mellow of relationship with Krishna. Now we have a sambandha. We are no longer a part of this world. No longer, no plan of ours would be made for the benefit of furtherance in this world. Every plan would, every minute would possibly go into being able to move forward. Then you get to know, then he becomes fixed and he's chanting. Then, he, you know, then there's this development of taste, then there's development of attachment. So there's ruchi, there's ashakti. Yeah, ashakti is, it's almost, dis, it is not discernible. There are certain qualities between different you know, what, what I would say is different symptoms that come up during these different stages. And that is discussed in Madhuri Kadambani. Um, those of you who are interested, you could go to my website, sandini.com. And in sandini.com, I have given a series of classes on Madhuri Kadambani, and you could listen to it. I have described these stages. But these stages are being described where he goes through being fixed. He also goes through being uh, in, in ecstatic emotions. He is in love. Tears are pouring out of his eyes. He can't see tears are pouring out. This is spontaneous. Because material energy, it is not interfering with ecstasies anymore. The body does not know how to respond. The body does not know how to respond to this wonderful thing which is happening. The body does not know how to accept the happiness that comes. It is surcharging him. He's just crying out in ecstasy. Tears are pouring out of his eyes. He can't see anything and he's calling out the names. He is in Bhava, the Krishna appears, and he's experiencing Krishna's presence. 
And as he experiences Krishna's presence, he becomes even more eager to experience it after the fact. And he continues chanting. And he leaves his body in such a state of eagerness of wanting to be with Krishna. So this eagerness of wanting to be with Krishna, eagerness of wanting to come in touch with Krishna in one of the mellows of Krishna's pastimes, in one of the features of Vrindavan, this eagerness is also a gift of association. Sadhana bhakti is a gift of association. Faith is a gift of association. Raga Nuga Bhakti is a gift of association. If you're not in touch with those who are greedy, the greed will not come to us. The greed has its origin in the heart of those who are greedy. And the heart of those who are greedy, they have the ability to give us greed. It is again association. You have to come in touch with those who are greedy. And then we get this particular uh, feature of being able to also become greedy for more and more and more. So we'll end here. And in the next week, we will continue with chapter seven, I guess. Any questions or comments on today's discussion? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Bandit Pranam, Jai Srila Prabhupada. Thank you Jai so Shri much Prabhupada. for the end evening session. Almost, you know, so many questions were hidden in my heart till now, and many of them were answered due to your lecture in this session. Thank you so much, Prabhu. I have Thank one you, question mm -hmm. regarding ahead, a Vedanta Sutra compilation by Srila Vyasadeva. So, was that done after Srila Narada Muni instructed Vyasadeva? No, no. The Vedanta Sutras were already compiled by Srila Vyasadeva. The Vedanta Sutras are an extraction of approximately 550 to 600 verses from the Vedas. Okay, so basically, initially, they were all the Vedas were together. Then Srila Vyasadeva separated the Vedas into their objectives. So, for example, Yajur Veda focuses on fire sacrifices. Rig Veda focuses on specific mantras. Sama Veda eulogizes the Lord. It is considered to be the most, I would say, closely connected to Bhakti. The Sama Veda is considered to be the most profound. And then the other Veda has certain spells. So Ayurveda, um, even for example, astrology, Ayurveda, all of these have a lot of links to Atharva Veda. So he basically split, split the Veda into parts for ease of I would say access. And then he gave the parts to different personalities so that they could develop a disciplic succession who would become real experts in those parts. Then he extracted the most important essence of the Vedas, which is the conclusion of the Vedas. That is the reason why it is called Veda Anta. Veda Anta means conclusion of the Vedas. So he extracted the conclusion of the Vedas and he compiled them. That is approximately the 500 to 550 verses. This is the Vedanta Sutra. The focus of the Vedanta Sutra literally is not to accomplish things in the world, but to attain moksha. So this is particularly the objective of Vedanta Sutras is particularly to attain and to leave the material sky. How do we go beyond? How do we attain the fourth pillar of achievement? The four Vedas, on the other hand, which were compiled by him, had a lot of knowledge in being able to attain fruits of this particular world. The Vedanta Sutra basically denounces such objectives and says that leaving the world and going beyond the world is a true objective. So the Vedanta Sutra is basically the jnani's treasure. The jnani who has become endowed with knowledge, how does one become endowed with knowledge? They come into this world, they go through frustrations, and they go through frustrations, they develop jnan. And because of this particular jnan, then basically they develop detachment. And then they pursue a course of wanting to be completely free of such influences. So this particular body of knowledge which gives them the ability and motivates them to go beyond denounces material existence. That is the Vedanta Sutras. It was already done by Srila Vyasadeva. It was already done. He had already written the Mahabharata. He had already written the Puranas. He had already given us the different Upanishads, everything else. He was despondent. At that particular stage, after accomplishing so much, why was he despondent? Because in the first stage, he is in touch with material energy because he's touched with, he's doing things for the karmis. 
In the second stage, he is writing things for the jnanis. He has not written for the bhaktas yet. Now, Srimad Bhagavatam, the only objective is to cater to bhaktiras. So that is done after the fact. That is the lineage. I mean, sorry, that is the, um, I would say, stages. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. It's very much clear now. Thank you so much. I was just thinking, is it such Srimad Bhagavatam? I was under that impression. Thank you so much, Prabhu. No problem. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, yes, Dhanavad Brahm Prabhu. Uh, I'm just in a bus, but I just wanted to quickly ask this question before the bus starts. Uh, Prabhu, uh, I wanted to ask you, although we, we feel when you are chanting, this is my own uh, experience, own, my own personal question, we know uh, it chanting is uh, it's good and we feel it, but still, why you don't have enthusiasm and determination just to do it? This is my, for my, for me, this question is Prabhu. Why, where I am uh, going wrong? Why I'm not getting that taste? I have the taste when I start. I always had a starting problem. I don't know why. Well, the, the reason why we struggle is because we are in touch with passion and ignorance. So what do we do? We reorient and we examine our life to make improvements upon the whole objective of passion again. How do we improve ourselves in that direction? That's what we need to do. So basically, the reason why we don't really have taste is because the taste which we can come in touch with Krishna is being contaminated by the presence of passion and ignorance. What is the way to clear it out? Greater endeavor, more chanting, greater endeavor, more focused chanting, um, begging for mercy, very important, very important. Become very sad, beg for mercy. Please beg for mercy. If you don't feel ecstatic, if you do not have the ability to chant and you are struggling, you feel chanting is normal, beg for mercy. It will work. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, um, mainly, uh, once I start, I'm fine. That starting is the difficulty. I do not, I don't know, all the time it's like that. Why I'm not it, having, but after that, I don't want to sometimes leave. I go even more. <laughs> I don't know why I'm struggling at the beginning. This is, I don't know. I really want to fix that. That's why Prabhu, I'm asking. You should, you should engage in Guru Puja. Okay. Uh, Samsara yeah. Dhaman? Oh, no. Uh, Samsara Guru Dhaman, Vandana I do. Go, okay, Guru Vandana Prayer. Okay. Try that. Okay. okay. Try that yeah. and also chant Lord Narasimha's mantras, Narasimha's yeah. names, requesting him for help. I do that, Prabhu. Yeah, but requesting him for help. You mean to say before chant. chanting? Before chanting. You mean chanting. to say, Prabhu, before chanting? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Prabhu. I will just put Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sure. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, one more question. Can I ask Prabhu? Yes. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yes, Prabhuji. So uh, you said that why Vedas sustained so long and you were giving an explanation, I was lost. Can you please explain that, Prabhuji, one more time? Sure, sure. Um, basically, whatever is considered to be true should exist forever. That is the reason why we say Sat. Chit, Ananda. If something is true, it cannot get lost, it cannot disappear, it can't die. Truth can never die. That is why the nature of existence in this world is asat. Because this world, the material bodies, material universe, it is created, it disappears after some time. As a consequence, while it is true for some time, it eventually becomes false. So the nature of truth is that it can never perish. That is the fundamental quality of truth. So if something, when does it perish? Perishing happens when there's a lot of mode of ignorance involved. So for example, this is a practical example. We all know that meat, meat, it decays much faster than vegetables. Meat is filled with mode of ignorance 
As a consequence, the decaying process is so intense that includes the physical body. When the soul leaves the body, the dead body deteriorates so fast. Why is it so? Because the mode of ignorance is quite profound. It doesn't last. On the other hand, vegetables, they have the greater ability to sustain themselves because there's greater sattva in them. You can notice this in the world, that vegetables can last much longer than meat. So they don't decay as rapidly as meat does because they have a greater level of sattva, greater level of goodness. In a similar way, knowledge, which has a lot of truth in it, knowledge which is connected to transcendence, never perishes. It never goes away. Knowledge which is steeped in ignorance keeps changing. So we notice, for example, scientific conclusions being overturned, conclusions about the nature of disease being overturned. Every few years, someone comes up with a new theory. Why is it so? Because there is certain falsehood associated with their research. It is associated with passion and ignorance. As a consequence, it can never be true. It gets overturned. So knowledge which is material constantly deteriorates and it changes. Knowledge which is spiritual and which is steeped in transcendence lasts for a longer time. That's the reason why even though the appearance of the Lord as Krishna, appearance of the Lord as Sri Ram, appearance of the Lord in different avatars took place millions of years ago. Why is it so profound even now? Why is it so capable of giving us a connection now? It's because it's transcendental. It is not subject to the process of decay. So this was the point I was trying to express saying, anything which is free from the modes of passion and ignorance will last longer. That is why you will notice that devotees, their entire facial, I would say, features change when they come into devotional service. When they start calling upon the holy names and when they start coming in touch with devotional service, their nature changes. So, for example, I'll give you one last example to say this. There was a group of, I would say, um, um, Christian priests, and they were pure vegetarian. And they were very serious in the chanting of the mantra which they were used to chanting. Not the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, but they had a certain system of chanting in their parampara in, in uh, Europe. So the system was that they used to go into a cave. When they chose, when they took vows, they used to go into a cave. People should, they will seal the cave from outside. They will not come out. Only the dead body will come out. They will continuously chant. They will be given certain fruits. They will be given certain water, everything from outside through some kind of a window. They can't come out. They will be inside the cave. They will be chanting. They will die. And then there will be others who are chanting in the cave. They will inform people that someone has died. Then they will open the cave and they will remove the body. So when such a process was going on, they removed one of the bodies. And normally those bodies, even though they have died, would not have decayed. Why? Because that person was constantly engaged in chanting the very specific mantras of their lineage, whatever it was, as a consequence, even the body's decaying process was extraordinarily delayed. Because the activity of the body was slowly becoming spiritual and more and more spiritual, the decaying process becomes delayed. And as a consequence, you find that basically the decaying of the body was not happening. We have observed it in, in, in the deaths of some of our sannyasis, where even after one day, one and a half days after dying, you will find that the body is very supple. It is very soft to touch. The fingers are still very pliable. The, you know, the rigor mort is the, the whole becoming very hard and unwieldy process would have already, um, you know, would, would not have come into play because the body has been used for Krishna's service. As a consequence, there's a greater level of goodness in the body. And as a consequence, it has the ability to withstand the, uh, and resist the mode of ignorance and the decaying process. So this is what I was trying to share. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. You know, as Hare you... Prabhu. Hare Krishna, this is Krishna Vani. Prabhuji, as you are saying that, you know, like meat is, you know, like... Uh, uh, it, it, it decays faster. But then people, you know, say that, you know, like uh, meat eaters, they, 
they not, don't have deficiency of protein and the vegetarians have always deficiency of protein so how do they get so much protein by eating meat Pro protein is not so wonderful mm -hmm. so we, we we don't want to assume that protein in itself and having a lot of protein is wonderful it, 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 because it is necessary and when we eat dal different kinds of dal etc <laughs> Um, we do receive protein. So the point I'm trying to make is that um, meat in general has a lot of protein, but mm. protein itself is not considered to be very useful beyond a certain point for spiritual progress. <clears throat> but uh, but uh, no, my question was that in the meat, you know, like it's a dead body, and still, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, it still gives out you so much protein by eating. Um, I, I'm not sure if I understood your question because can you explain again what your question was? Sorry. Because, you know, like as we are vegetarians and we always, people always, you know, like uh, make comments that, you know, like because you are vegetarian, you, you don't receive so much of protein. And yes. my, my question was that, you know, like once the, you know, like animal dies, you know, like uh, still, you know, like people are eating dead bodies and they are receiving protein and stuff. So is it, is it possible or I don't know? Okay, I get, I get your point. Yeah, see the point is, the answer is there could be a source of protein, obviously in meat, mm -hmm. obviously, but along with protein, comes the fact that it has been dead for so long as a consequence you also receive the mode of ignorance. Yeah. Our source of protein is from milk. Our source of protein is from, uh, you know, different um, lentils, dal, etc. Mm. So we get our proteins as well. And then our protein does not have a debilitating effect, which is normally associated with meat, mm. you know, succumbing in touch with something that is dead. So the point I'm trying to make is, yes, you can receive some nutrients from a dead body as well. Uh -huh. But there's also great harm in that, mm. along with that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so, Prabhu? So our response, our response, uh, our response to the statements made by people saying that meat has more protein should be that, you know, we get what proteins we need. We're all right with it. We can, we can manage with it. Yeah, we have lots of protein in our dals as well, lentils. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there's one more question, Prabhu, that you yes. know, like the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam is not different than Krishna, right? The yes. book Bhagavatam. But uh, is it possible, you know, like to, to read, even if you haven't taken a bath, is it, uh, can you, are you be able, are we able to touch the book when, you know, like sometimes I don't take bath straight away. So is it possible to touch? See, here's the situation. I, I personally wouldn't discourage you. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't discourage you because if it motivates you from the heart, but approaching Srimad Bhagavatam prayerfully is important. Okay. So more than external cleanliness, it is important for you to be clean inside when you're approaching Srimad Bhagavatam. You should approach it very prayerfully. And as with any other activity associated with Krishna consciousness, if you have had a bath and if you have dressed and you've done your uh, archaman, etc., there's a better, I would say this, it, it, it offers you a better opportunity. The point is it's always better. Okay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. The experience is much better. All right. But I wouldn't discourage you. If you're motivated to reach Srimad Bhagavatam and you've even had your bath, I wouldn't say that, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't touch it. You know, go ahead and read. It's nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, yes. One quick question. Uh, this is about, uh, you know, the milk industry is having a lot of uh, difficulty now. Veganism is coming up. The, just because of uh, artific artificial imprinting of the cows, so uh, so that means our mode of goodness is uh, won't be that good when you drink that that type of milk, isn't it? I don't know. I just uh, I just want yeah. you to tell me something about that, and I'm not going to speak long because I'm in a bus. I would like you 
good to speak. Okay, Prabhu. Sure. I, I hope sure you understood thing. my question. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 yeah, I was quite clear. So thank you for asking. See, basically the point is as follows. The answer is yes. There is a lot of, I would say, contamination in the process of extracting milk. There's contamination in what the cows are being fed. There's contamination in the objective of the dairy industry in every country, including India, for that matter. Um, however, having said all of this, um, I remember reading about an incident about Srila Prabhupada in New York. And in America, you can't buy milk in general, which does not contain contamination through animal and fish protein. They add vitamins for the purpose of fortifying the milk, and that vitamin has a fish or animal source. As a consequence, you can't buy pure milk. And this was the case back in the 60s when Srila Prabhupada was visiting. And the devotees, they found out that this milk had this issue, and they approached Prabhupada and they asked him, saying, Srila Prabhupada, there's milk, but then the milk is contaminated. He said, milk can't be contaminated. Milk will purify everything, so it's okay. That was his answer. Because this is a Vedic truth. Okay. Oh, okay. It answers yeah. everything, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Sure. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Bo. Yeah, yeah. I get the point. Yeah, Prabhupada said milk, so we are okay. Because I have that concern myself. Because so many times I've thought of going vegan just because how the cows are treated. So the best I can do is now I've started using organic milk. But then still right. there are so many milk products that are not organic. And the point you made, like it's fortified with fish oil. And they started doing that in UK as well. But I don't think they do that with all the milks. So, uh, so we, Maybe not. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, yeah. I agree that you know, we, can, we can shop around. And yes, I think these, yeah. days, these days the awareness is quite high. These days, I think in the UK, for instance, you have Ahimsa. Yes. Milk, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are so not fortunate to go because the waiting list very, very big, <laughs> and I always had a desire because I kept saying to my husband, "I want to buy a house in countryside so I can keep a cow." And the Shams and the Prabhuji, who used to look after cows in Watford, and he agreed. He said, "Right, I'll give you my cows if you can't look after. I'll take them back." But unfortunately, it hasn't happened so far. <laughs> so, yeah. So All we right. are okay to use milk then. So because I, I feel bad as well. You know, we are offering to Krishna. And yeah, because it, it, Srila Prabhupada was applying a very fundamental Vedic principle that cow's milk is purifying. Yeah, yeah. yeah? yeah. Just as yeah. cow's urine is purifying, yes. cow's milk is purifying. He was applying a very simple principle. So what I'm saying is, um, whilst we can try to improve, we don't want to basically feel intimidated by the circumstances. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Haribo. Any other question? Haribo. Prabhu, the, yeah, on this milk as well. I was thinking, you know, we live near, you know, in in London and uh, near Manor, but yeah. you know, yeah. even at the Manor, they use, uh, you know, the you know, the temple temples cows milk for deities, but also for you know like cooking and everything that that milk is not sufficient so they have to depend on outside milk and they they do have to use it for the deities and devotees and everything so that's why you know like i was thinking that when we offer it all these you know like uh, what you call uh, karmas and everything gets nullified because in the circumstances at the moment yes if you are we are not as fortunate as you that living in the dham, so milk and every pure things are available. So, you know, like we just have to, you know, like use it, whatever is, you know, available. True. True. Yeah, I think we can use what's available and offer it to Krishna while we try to make improvements. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Sure. Anything else? Okay, so if there isn't anything else, we'll conclude today's session. 
and we'll meet next week and then we start a fresh chapter was there something did i see someone wanting to say something haribo was anybody wanting to ask a question i heard some noise okay so we will conclude today's session we'll meet next week and the next week's session we'll start a brand new chapter um we'll be coming into and observing the lives of great personalities next week the pandavas the intensity of their devotion the tribulations it'll be a wonderful experience so we'll continue next week shila prabhu pad ki jai